Chapter 9 Boxer's split hoof was a long time in healing. They had started the rebuilding of the windmill the day after the victory celebrations were ended. Boxer refused to take even a day off work and made it a point of honor not to let it be seen that he was in pain. In the evenings, he would admit privately to Clover that the hoof troubled him a great deal. Clover treated the hoof with poultices of herbs, which she prepared by chewing them, and both she and Benjamin urged Boxer to work less hard. A horse's lungs do not last forever, she said to him, but Boxer would not listen. He had, he said, only one real ambition left, to see the windmill well underway before he reached the age for retirement. At the beginning, when the laws of Animal Farm were first formulated, the retiring age had been fixed for horses and pigs at 12, for cows at 14, for dogs at 9, for sheep at 7, and for hens and geese at 5. Liberal old age pensions had been agreed upon. As yet, no animal had actually retired on pension, but of late the subject had been discussed more and more. Now that the small field beyond the orchard had been set aside for barley, it was rumored that a corner of the large pasture was to be fenced off and turned into a grazing ground for superannuated animals. For a horse, it was said, the pension would be five pounds of corn a day and, in winter, 15 pounds of hay with a carrot or possibly an apple on public holidays. Boxer's 12th birthday was due in the late summer of the following year. Meanwhile, life was hard. The winter was as cold as the last one had been, and food was even shorter. Once again, all rations were reduced except those of the pigs and the dogs. A too rigid equality in rations, Squealer explained, would have been contrary to the principles of animalism. In any case, he had no difficulty in proving to the other animals that they were not in reality short of food, whatever the appearances might be. For the time being, certainly, it had been found necessary to make a readjustment of rations. Squealer always spoke of it as a readjustment, never as a reduction. But in comparison with the days of Jones, the improvement was enormous. Reading out the figures in a shrill, rapid voice, he proved to them in detail that they had more oats, more hay, more turnips than they had had in Jones's day, that they had that they worked shorter hours, that their drinking water was of better quality, that they lived longer, that a larger proportion of their young ones survived infancy, and that they had more straw in their stalls and suffered less from fleas. The animals believed every word of it. Truth to tell, Jones and all he stood for had almost faded out of their memories. They knew that life nowadays was harsh and bare, that they were often hungry and often cold, and that they were usually working when they were not asleep. But doubtless it had been worse in the old days. They were glad to believe so. Besides, in those days, they had been slaves, and now they were free, and that made all the difference, as Squealer did not fail to point out. There were many more mouths to feed now. In the autumn, the four sows had all littered about simultaneously, producing 31 young pigs between them. The young pigs were piebald, and as Napoleon was the only boar on the farm, it was possible to guess at their parentage. It was announced that later, when bricks and timber had been purchased, a schoolroom would be built in the farmhouse garden. For the time being, the young pigs were given their instruction by Napoleon himself in the farmhouse kitchen. They took their exercise in the garden and were discouraged from playing with the other young animals. About this time, too, it was laid down as a rule that when a pig and any other animal met on the path, the other animal must stand aside, and also that all pigs, of whatever degree, were to have the privilege of wearing green ribbons on their tails on Sundays. The farm had had a fairly successful year, but was still short of money. There were the bricks, sand, and lime for the schoolroom to be purchased, and it would also be necessary to begin saving up again for the machinery for the windmill. Then there were lamp oil and candles for the house, sugar for Napoleon's own table. He forbade this to the other pigs on the ground that it made them fat. And all the usual replacements such as tools, nails, string, coal, wire, scrap iron, and dog biscuits. A stump of hay and part of the potato crop were sold off, and the contract for eggs was increased to 600 a week, 
so that the year that so that year the hens barely hatched enough chicks to keep their numbers at the same level. Rations reduced in December were reduced again in February, and lanterns in the stalls were forbidden to save oil. But the pigs seemed comfortable enough, and in fact were putting on weight, if anything. One afternoon in late February, a warm, rich, appetizing scent, such as the animals had never smelt before, wafted itself across the yard from the little brew house, which had been disused in Jones's time, and which stood beyond the kitchen. Someone said it was the smell of cooking barley. The animals sniffed the air hungrily and wondered whether a warm mash was being prepared for their supper. But no warm mash appeared, and on the following Sunday it was announced that from now onwards all barley would be reserved for the pigs. The field beyond the orchard had already been sown with barley, and the news soon leaked out that every pig was now receiving a ration of a pint of beer daily, which half a, with half a gallon for Napoleon himself, which was always served to him in the Crown Derby soup terrain. But if there were hardships to be borne, they were partly offset by the fact that life nowadays had a greater dignity than it had had before. There were more songs, more speeches, more processions. Napoleon had commanded that once a week there should be held something called a spontaneous demonstration, the object of which was to celebrate the struggles and triumphs on, triumphs on Animal Farm. At the appointed time, the animals would leave their work and march round the precincts of the farm in military formation, with the pigs leading, then the horses, then the cows, then the sheep, and then the poultry. The dogs flanked the procession, and at the head of all marched Napoleon's black cockerel. Boxer and Clover always carried between them a green banner marked with the hoof and the horn and the caption, Long Live Comrade Napoleon. Afterwards, there were recitations of poems composed in Napoleon's honor and a speech by Squealer giving particulars of the latest increases in the production of foodstuffs, and on occasion a shot was fired from the gun. The sheep were the greatest devotees of the spontaneous demonstrations, and if anyone complained, as a few animals sometimes did when no pigs or dogs were near, that they wasted time and meant a lot of standing about in the cold, the sheep were sure to silence him with a tremendous bleeding of four legs good, two legs bad. But by and large, the animals enjoyed these celebrations. They found it comforting to be reminded that, after all, they were truly their own masters and that the work they did was for their own benefit. So that what with the songs, the processions, squealers' lists of figures, the thunder of the gun, the crowing of the cockerel, and the fluttering of the flag, they were able to forget that their bellies were empty, at least part of the time. In April, Animal Farm was proclaimed a republic, and it became necessary to elect a president. There was only one candidate, Napoleon, who was elected unanimously. On the same day, it was given out that fresh documents had been discovered, which revealed further details about Snowball's complicity with Jones. It now appeared that Snowball had not, as the animals had previously imagined, merely attempted to lose the Battle of the Cowshed by means of a stratagem, but had been openly fighting on Jones's side. In fact, it was he who had actually been the leader of the human forces and had charged into battle with the words, long live humanity on his lips. The wounds on Snowball's back, which a few of the animals still remembered to have seen, had been inflicted by Napoleon's teeth. In the middle of the summer, Moses the raven suddenly reappeared on the farm after an absence of several years. He was quite unchanged, still did no work, and talked in the same strain as ever about Sugar Candy Mountain. He would perch on a stump, flap his black wings, and talk by the hour to anyone who would listen. Up there, comrades, he would say solemnly, pointing to the sky with his large beak. Up there, just on the other side of that dark cloud that you can see, there it lies, Sugar Candy Mountain, that happy country where we poor animals shall rest forever from our labors. He even claimed to have been there on one of his higher frights and to have seen the everlasting fields of clover and the linseed cake and lump sugar growing on the hedges. Many of the animals believed him. Their lives now, they reasoned, were hungry and laborious. Was it not right and just that a better world should exist somewhere else? 
A thing that was difficult to determine was the attitude of the pigs towards Moses. They all declared contemptuously that his stories about Sugar Candy Mountain were lies, and yet they allowed him to remain on the farm, not working with an allowance of a gill of beer a day. After his hoof had healed up, Boxer worked harder than ever. Indeed, all the animals worked like slaves that year. Apart from the regular work of the farm and the rebuilding of the windmill, there was the schoolhouse for the young pigs, which was started in March. Sometimes the long hours on insufficient food were hard to bear, but Boxer never faltered. In nothing that he said or did was there any sign that his strength was not what it had been. It was only his appearance that was a little altered. His hide was less shiny than it had used to be, and his great haunches seemed to have shrunken. The others said, Boxer will pick up when the spring grass comes on, but the spring grass came and Boxer grew no fatter. Sometimes on the slope leading to the top of the quarry, when he braced his muscles against the weight of some vast boulder, it seemed that nothing kept him on his feet except the will to continue. At such times, his lips were seen to form the words, I will work harder. He had no voice left. Once again, Clover and Benjamin warned him to take care of his health, but Boxer paid no attention. His twelfth birthday was approaching. He did not care what happened so long as a good store of stone was accumulated before he went on pension. Late one evening in the summer, a sudden rumor ran round the farm that something had happened to Boxer. He had gone out alone to drag a load of stone down to the windmill. And sure enough, the rumor was true. A few minutes later, two pigeons came racing in with the news. Boxer has fallen. He is lying on his side and can't get up. About half the animals on the farm rushed out to the knoll where the windmill stood. There lay Boxer between the shafts of the cart, his neck stretched out, unable to e even to raise his head. His eyes were glazed, his sides matted with sweat. A thin stream of blood had trickled out of his mouth. Clover dropped to her knees at his side. Boxer, she cried, how are you? It is my lung, said Boxer in a weak voice. It does not matter. I think you will be able to finish the windmill without me. There is a pretty good store of stone accumulated. I had only another month to go in any case. To tell you the truth, I had been looking forward to my retirement. And perhaps, as Benjamin is growing old too, they will let him retire at the same time and be a companion to me. We must get help at once, said Clover. Run, somebody, and tell Squealer what has happened. All the other animals immediately raced back to the farmhouse to give Squealer the news. Only Clover remained and Benjamin, who lay down at Boxer's side and, without speaking, kept the flies off him with his long tail. After about a quarter of an hour, Squealer appeared, full of sympathy and concern. He said that Comrade Napoleon had learned with the very deepest distress of this misfortune to one of the most loyal workers on the farm and was already making arrangements to send Boxer to be treated in the hospital at Willingdon. The animals felt a little uneasy at this. Except for Molly and Snowball, no other animal had left, ever left the farm and they did not like to think of their sick comrade in the hands of human beings. However, Squealer easily convinced them that the veterinary surgeon in Willingdon could treat Boxer's case more satisfactorily than could be done on the farm. And about half an hour later, when Boxer had somewhat recovered, he was with difficulty got onto his feet and managed to limp back to his stall where Clover and Benjamin had prepared a good bed of straw for him. For the next two days, Boxer remained in his stall. The pigs had sent out a large bottle of pink medicine, which they had found in the medicine chest in the bathroom, and Clover administered it to Boxer twice a day after meals. In the evenings, she lay in his stall and talked to him while Benjamin kept the flies off him. Boxer professed not to be sorry for what had happened. If he made a good recovery, he might expect to live another three years, and he looked forward to the peaceful days that he would spend in the corner of the big pasture. It would be the first time that he had had leisure to study and improve his mind. He intended, he said, to devote the rest of his life to learning the remaining 22 letters of the alphabet. However, Benjamin and Clover could only be with Boxer after working hours, and it was in the middle of the day when the van came to take him away. The animals were all at work, weeding turnips under the supervision of a pig, when they were astonished to see Benjamin come galloping from the direction of the farm buildings, braying at the top of his voice. 
It was the first time that they had ever seen Benjamin excited. Indeed, it was the first time that anyone had ever seen him gallop. Quick, quick, he shouted. Come at once. They're taking Boxer away. Without waiting for orders from the pig, the animals broke off work and raced back to the farm buildings. Sure enough, there in the yard was a large closed van, drawn by two horses with lettering on its side and a sly-looking man in a low-crowned bowler hat sitting on the driver's seat, and Boxer's stall was empty. The animals crowded round the van. Goodbye, Boxer, they chorused goodbye. Fools, fools, shouted Benjamin, prancing round them and stamping the earth with his hoofs. Fools, do you not see what is written on the side of that van? That gave the animals pause, and there was a hush. Muriel began to spell out the words, but Benjamin pushed her aside, and in the midst of a deadly silence, he read, Alfred Simmons, horse slaughterer and glue boiler, Willingdon, dealer in hides and bone meal, kennels supplied. Do you not understand what that means? They are taking Boxer to the knackers. A cry of horror burst from all the animals. At this moment, the man on the box whipped up his horses and the van moved out of the yard at a smart trot. All the animals followed, crying out at the tops of their voices. Clover forced her way to the front. The van began to gather speed. Clover tried to stir her stout limbs to a gallop and achieved a cancer, canter. Boxer, she cried, boxer, boxer, boxer. And just at this moment, as though he had heard the uproar outside, Boxer's face with the white stripe down his nose appeared at the small window at the back of the van. Boxer, cried Clover in a terrible voice. Boxer, get out, get out quickly. They are taking you to your death. All the animals took up the cry of, get out, Boxer, get out. But the van was already gathering speed and drawing away from them. It was uncertain whether Boxer had understood what Clover had said. But a moment later, his face disappeared from the window and there was the sound of a tremendous drumming of hoofs inside the van. He was trying to kick his way out. The time had been when a few kicks from Boxer's hoofs would have smashed the van to matchwood, but alas, his strength had left him. And in a few moments, the sound of drumming hoofs grew fainter and died away. In desperation, the animals began appealing to the two horses which drew the van to stop. Comrades, comrades, they shouted, don't take your own brother to his death. But the stupid brutes, too ignorant to realize what was happening, merely set back their ears and quickened their pace. Boxer's face did not reappear at the window. Too late, someone thought of racing ahead and shutting the five-barred gate, but in, in another moment, the van was through it and rapidly disappearing down the road. Boxer was never seen again. Three days later, it was announced that he had died in the hospital at Willingdon, in spite of receiving every attention a horse could have. Squealer came to announce the news to the others. He had, he said, been present during Boxer's last hours. It was the most affecting sight I have ever seen, said Squealer, lifting his trotter and wiping away a tear. I was at his bedside at the very last, and at the end, almost too weak to speak, he whispered in my ear that his sole sorrow was to have passed on before the windmill finished. Forward, comrades, he whispered. Forward in the name of the rebellion. Long live Animal Farm. Long live Comrade Napoleon. Napoleon is always right. Those were his very last words, comrades. Here, Squealer's demeanor suddenly changed. He fell silent for a moment, and his little eyes darted suspicious glances from side to side before he proceeded. It had come to his knowledge, he said, that a foolish and wicked rumor had been circulated at the time of Boxer's removal. Some of the animals had noticed that the van which took Boxer away was marked horse slaughterer, and had actually jumped to the conclusion that Boxer was being sent to the knackers. It was almost unbelievable, said Squealer, that any animal could be so stupid. Surely, he cried indignantly, whisking his tail and skipping from side to side. Surely they knew their beloved leader, Comrade Napoleon, better than that? But the explanation was really very simple. The van had previously been the property of the knacker and had been bought by the veterinary surgeon who had not yet painted the old name out. That was how the mistake had arisen. The animals were enormously relieved to hear this. And when Squealer went on to give further graphic details of Boxer's deathbed, the admirable care he had received and the expensive medicines for which Napoleon had paid without a thought as to the cost, 
their last doubts disappeared and the sorrow that they felt for their comrade's death was tempered by the thought at least he had died happy. Napoleon himself appeared at the meeting on the following Sunday morning and pronounced a short oration in Boxer's honor. It had not been possible, he said, to bring back their lamented Conrad's remains for interment on the farm, but he had ordered a large wreath to be made for the laurels in the farmhouse garden and sent down to be placed on Boxer's grave. And in a few days' time, the pigs intended to hold a memorial banquet in Boxer's honor. Napoleon ended his speech with a reminder of Boxer's two favorite maxims, I will work harder, and Comrade Napoleon is always right. Maxims, he said, which every animal would do well to adopt as his own. On the day appointed for the banquet, a grocer's van drove up to Willingdon and delivered a large wooden crate at the farmhouse. That night, there was the sound of uproarious singing, which was followed by what sounded like a violent quarrel and ended at about 11 o'clock with a tremendous crash of glass. No one stirred in the farmhouse before noon on the following day, and the word went round that from somewhere or other, the pigs had acquired the money to buy themselves another case of whiskey.'"